Hi, this is Rory Block celebrating 20 years of retrospectives with John Broughton on 3SER Casey Radio. I believe uh, your, your early introduction to guitar was in classical style, is that right? That's, yes, that's correct. Where did your interest in, in that field develop? Well, my entire family was playing classical music from before I could remember. My father's family had classical violin players, and my mother had uh, played classical guitar. And from the time that I, from the earliest time I could remember, there was always classical music playing, and we just automatically took classical lessons, all of us. There was piano and recorder and violin and viola, and <clears throat> we had a family orchestra. Do you ever stop and ponder how, how your career may have turned out? Had you continued in that direction? I don't think I, I don't think that I would have under any circumstances. I love classical music more than anything in the world, and it's the one form of music that I listen to now more than anything. But I don't think that I had... I, I think that I was very much driven towards folk music. I was very much driven towards, towards a different kind of, of sort of much freer kind of music. So I don't think that I would have... I, I found that to be a discipline, and I, I almost found it to be more confining than what I wanted for myself. But I'm glad that I did all that studying because it affected me in many ways in the music that I play now. Right. So you found a music form a lot more enjoyable to listen to than to try and master yourself. Well, there was a lot of joy in it when I was doing it, and I was very good at it. I read music very well. I... I I had the feeling of it. I understood it quite well, and and it is very possible that I could have done it if somebody had sort of stood over me and and absolutely said, "You're going to do this," and and made me do it. I probably would have had a career out of it. Yeah. But it was it was um, it wasn't as much joy to me as blues and country and folk music and things that had more lure to me. Yeah, a very early memory for you, perhaps in your introduction to blues. Do you have any there? Oh yes. Um, well, the the uh, the music scene initially was taking place in Washington Square Park. The music scene, the folk music scene that I was aware of. And I was standing around one day, and there was a. It was a very crowded day with a lot of uh, groups of, of different kinds of music were were in in different groups. And people were all pressing in to hear what was going on. And I was moving from group to group, as I always did, listening to bluegrass and old-timey music. And then one day I just heard this ragtime-style guitar, and I just thought it was the best thing I'd ever heard. And, and it was Stefan Grossman playing guitar, and I started talking to him, and we struck up a friendship. And he gave me an album called Really the Country Blues, and I listened to that. And that, that was just the beginning of this lifelong love affair with blues. Reading your profile on, you mentioned that you were able to, to transcribe old blues songs note for note from, from original recordings at, at a very young age. Did anyone actually teach you this skill, or was it just something you naturally acquired, just a gift you, knew, you just found that you had? I wouldn't call myself uh, any more extraordinary than anybody else, and I'm sure that there are plenty of other people who do what I do much better than I do, but I, that was one of the things that I did find I had an ability to do. Uh, I still do it today when, I, when I'm when i looking into making a blues album. I still listen. Uh, nobody taught me to do it. It's just something where I started listening very closely. As, as I started learning the playing and the styles and the picking and the chords and so on, uh, I realized that uh, it, it, it made me tune in to the music so closely that I began to be able to figure out, well, now, wait a minute, that note doesn't sound right in that part that must be a different tuning and then i would start exploring tunings until and then it became an obsession <clears throat> excuse me and i began really tuning in i think you can sort of tune yourself into it you can you can shut out everything else and decide to do nothing but that and then you get good at it and it's really the same as any other skill that you do that with i mean consider the idea of, of the first time you ever get up on ice skates or the first time you even get on a bicycle it seems like a completely improbable thing to do. And then as you start doing it, you become able to do it because you're, you've trained yourself. Yeah. Sure. 
Yeah, the list of blues greats that you, you met and played with in, in those early days, it's about as impressive as it gets. Did it really sink in with you at that time, the, the legendary status of these people? Or was that something that you probably appreciated now more with the passing of time? You, you it spent did, a- it, I was aware of how great they were at the time. Believe me, I was, I was truly aware. But now it seems ever more incredible that I was lucky enough to be there at that time and meet them. I knew that it was precious. It was, it was sacred to me. It really was. At the time, I just felt uh, surrounded with golden light. I mean, I really felt that, that, it, was, it, that it was precious in every way, and I knew that. But, but I didn't realize how fleeting it was, and I didn't realize how, how unusual it was to be able to be there. I, I kind of knew it, but now I know it more than I did then, and I think, my God, it's so lucky for me that I was there and so lucky that they happened to be brought through and that I knew people who were discovering them and and all of the factors came together and made it this truly unusual experience. I knew that it was, but I didn't realize how incredible in retrospect. And something you'll never forget, of course. Never. How were were their reactions to seeing this young teenage girl so, so taken with blues music? Would have been something they wouldn't have come across very often. No, I don't think they had ever come across it ever at that point. I really don't. And I, I, there was complete amazement. But I also think <clears throat> that they were completely amazed that um, young w- white people from up north were even interested in their music. When they recorded their music in the 40s, 30s, and so on, there was terrible racism, and, and, their, and their music wasn't even distributed to uh, white audiences it was called race music and it was very very hard to get and you could only get it <clears throat> in an, in a uh, uh, racially segregated areas so i'm sure they were completely shocked that they stopped recording and disappeared for a number of years and suddenly all these young people from up north were interested in their music and then more shockingly a young girl 14 years old is playing willie brown so <laughs> yes it was i'm sure very shocking obviously the- but, Obviously, but I'm sure they were also very, very pleased. Oh, of course. And obviously it didn't matter for you at the time that it wasn't really the, the usual thing for a girl your age to be to, be, to have such a passion for, for that type of music. It didn't, didn't matter to me at all. It, no. it, did, it did seem to surprise other people constantly. And, and even to this day, I am somewhat unusual if you, you know, people are constantly telling me that, that, you know, it is unusual and that most young girls my age would have would have started right into the rock and roll or whatever was on the top 40 radio <clears throat> had they wanted to be pop stars or whatever but that was not my motivation at the time oh, oh. Uh, one man in particular you had an association with was, was the great Sun House can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the type of man he was well I can't say that I really know what type of a man he was because that would be uh, taking it beyond where I knew him. I I simply knew him sitting in a room with him on a number of occasions, talking with him very sort of superficially, just enough to have him say, where did she learn to play like this? Just enough to have him say that he taught Robert Johnson how to play guitar. And just, just enough to sort of observe him as he sat there feeling a little out of place, wondering, again, why this was happening to him, why people were interested in his music suddenly. Uh, you know, and the man the man was probably in shock in some ways, but I, I found him to be incredibly fascinating. I found him to be very beautiful. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. I, fo- I found him to be uh, very youthful for his age, a kind of an ageless-looking person. Uh, they sort of said, well, he's this age or whatever and i just thought i can't believe that he just he, he and he took me back in history being in his presence more more than me really knowing everything about him it was just an experience of feeling that i was there in the past it, it's not something you can really put into words i just and i feel that a lot when i'm playing blues i just go go i go i disappear and i go into an another time zone perhaps uh and that's how i felt when i was with him i knew that i was in another time zone i was with somebody who had been there in the delta and who had played with robert johnson and and who had gone through the entire that entire period of history it just 
I, I feel very strongly, actually, about older people. I, I recently had a very, very dear friend who died finally at the age of 97, and she became really my best friend, and, and we spent all our time together, and I, I, found, I find that there's some connection that I have to older people or people from the past that seems very sacred to me. There, there was an early album you recorded with, with Stefan Grossman, which ended up being an instructional record for how to play blues guitar. That, that, yes. that, that wasn't your intent for it to, to be released that way, was it? No, because, you see, I felt that blues was everything, and I wasn't prepared for um, <clears throat> people saying to me, well, you know, that's all very nice and it's a curiosity, but you'll never make it doing blues. And I wasn't prepared for how it would get diminished all the time by people and people in the music business. And that was just one more thing that I felt at the time was diminishing it. It wasn't music in its own right. It was a curiosity, and it had to have a tablature booklet with it. Otherwise, nobody would even pick up the album. Now, it's good in a way, in retrospect, that it had tablature with it because people learned it, and that's very positive. And I'm, I do teach music now, and I didn't want to teach it then. But in a, at the same time, it's true that they did feel, because I heard them discussing it repeatedly, that it had to have something other than just the music. Otherwise, no one would even think twice about it, and that was sad to me. For a period of about 10 years there, ending in the, in the mid-70s, you, you put music on the back burner, so to speak. Was that a, a really difficult decision for you to make at that time? You know, it wasn't because uh, it, it just seemed like I wasn't supposed to do music. I, the way I was raised, um, was real. there was no support for having a career at all. There was no support for being a musician. It, it all seemed like stuff that I did when I was a kid, and it wasn't allowed when I got older. And that's the environment in which I was raised. And strangely enough, as, even though my father was very, quote, bohemian, and even though he was, um, you know, sort of um, eccentric and, and not at all what your average conventional person might uh, be, he was extremely traditional in other ways and both of my parents were as much as they wore sandals and wandered about seeming like bohemians in the in the 1960s in Greenwich Village they also got the message through to me that girls don't do this and that um, you know maybe kids do it and that's all fine and dandy but as soon as I got to be a teenager I, I had the message in me that it was totally unfeminine and I stopped so the harder thing was beginning again, not stopping. Stopping yeah. felt like that was, you know, you walk through a door and you leave that behind you. And then I found that it just kept coming back to me and kept coming back to me. And getting back into it was far more difficult, like learning to walk all over again. Did you put... After a, after a, you know, after a disease or something and losing your abilities, then you have to learn to, to walk and, yeah. you know, go through training. And that's how I felt. Did you put the guitar away totally during that time? Absolutely, and I still have a bad habit with that. I put my guitar away totally whenever I'm not on tour. And I find that I'm so emotional about my playing, and I'm so involved with it, and it's so uh, all-encompassing that as soon as I don't have to do it, I don't. And I just take a complete break from it. Uh, and I always have a problem when I go on tour. I develop my calluses during the tour and my playing gets very very strong and then I get home and then in a week's time your calluses start to get softer and you you know you take showers and you put your hands in water and before you know it your calluses are have to be rebuilt and so I just developed a sort of uh, pattern where every time I go on tour and I, don't believe me I go on tour so much that the calluses generally don't even really go away I go away yeah yeah but but I do have a pattern where I have a certain uh, procedure a certain number of nights on a certain number of nights off so that I can build up the calluses without my fingers literally bleeding because if I go back out on the road you know here's the thing I couldn't practice at home and duplicate a performance there's something about a performance that's ten times more intense more than a sound check more than a performance I mean more than practicing and if I go out on stage after two weeks of being at home, my hands get sore. I can't sit there every night. I've tried to sit there every night and reproduce the intensity of a show so that my hands will be ready, and it can't be done. I don't know why I have... It's, it, you know, you can theorize and say, well, it's the energy of the audience adding to my own energy. But I play very, very hard, and I just have 
no motivation to do that same type of thing when I'm at home and I'd rather be uh, doing paperwork on my on my desk or I have to be doing paperwork. There's more paperwork than I could ever take care of. <laughs> so that's what takes me away from it, really. Yeah. Uh, you had a brief period with major labels uh, when you did come back. How do you look back on that time now? Well, I feel like the climate was pretty different then, and, and you can sort of see by a lot of the other female artists who happened at that time, too, that there was this tremendous pressure, and some of them survived it. I would say Bonnie Raitt survived it quite well, and yeah. others of them did not survive it or didn't care. I've actually read interviews with other uh, female singers who just felt, give me the money, I'll do whatever you want. And I was very much not like that. I never felt like, give me the money, I'll do whatever you want. I was always deeply concerned with having artistic control and deeply concerned with uh, having the music having integrity. And I was constantly under a barrage of pressure. In fact, worse than a barrage, there was no choice when I first started out in the situations that I found myself in. It was their way or no record. And I found myself really totally depressed by that after a while and and that's when i kind of gave up and went back to rounder with these traditional albums remember if you will that everybody said to me blues is never going to make it Mm -hmm. and you have to do something else so when i came back to blues i just thought well it's all over for me you know i'm just going to do these records because i love the music but that's what made it happen and that's what i've learned is that under no circumstances do I ever say, I'm just going to do this because somebody else thinks it's going to make it big. I may think something that I'm going to do is is right on target and is really the right thing to do, and I may be interested in doing well, but I'm never going to do something and lose my artistic integrity just because it seems to be a trend. I gave that up a long time ago. I always knew it wasn't right anyway. It must have been, it must have been a great feeling of relief for you when when you did go to Rounder and which obviously allowed you to produce the type of music that you really wanted. A sense well, of release. Relief, yes, the relief was when I said to them, "Do you want me to make uh, some kind of commercial sounding song on this record that you can release as a single?" Knowing how record companies often, you know, ninety nine percent of the time, were saying, "Well, where's the single?" And they said, no, we don't care about that. We don't release singles. Just give us a record that you think is beautiful. And I was absolutely amazed. I thought, this is fantastic. Of course, I also thought nobody would give two hoots about my record and that that it would just completely be overlooked. And not long after it came out, it got this fantastic review in Rolling Stone that really launched my career. been a long association with Randa. It must be, obviously, it's mutually rewarding. Yes. Yeah, yes. and it's rare really for an artist to have such a long association with one label. I know, you know, and people do comment on it all the time, and I feel like the, the reason that I've had this long relationship with them is that they have given me complete artistic freedom. And people know me as somebody who has made albums for quite a while that are eclectic, that are not... Um, not restricted by a record company saying it has to be this kind of record or has to be that kind of a record and my audiences have been very tolerant in a way and very uh, very um, very kind I have to say in allowing me to put my own songs on records side by side with old blues songs and they they really are enthusiastic about it and when they come to my shows they request uh, the blues songs and they request Silver Wings and Love and Whiskey and Gypsy Boy and they, they, they know all the songs that I write too and they love them as much so I'm, I'm very lucky and Rounder, Rounder Records has allowed me to develop my career in that way. The, down, the downside is that I've known from the beginning that they do not compete in the same market as most of today's uh, moderate to large size labels and that I can't go soaring off into the top 40 because they aren't even releasing a single when I give them an album and they aren't even releasing a video and they aren't even they aren't even talking about doing that so I know from the get-go that my career uh, has gotten everywhere that it's gotten from my touring from my from a kind of grassroots development point of view there's actually quite solid after you do it for a while, then then it's like you're not a flash in the pan and you don't blow away after your latest album. You're really there to stay. So it has good sides, bad sides. 
the, an, another piece of news that could be better is that the, as they get larger and larger, Rounder Records is getting into the realm of releasing, you know, one of these days, maybe big enough to release a really good single with the right kind of promotion. But uh, in a way, I've made my career without that kind of pressure and without that kind of worry over my head all the time, and that's kind of a blessing. Yeah, and you're probably happy to keep it that way. Well, if if they all of a sudden said um, we're going to release a single, which they have actually on my on the last a uh, couple of albums ago, Tornado, they released a single, and you know what? It did really well. It got uh, picked up by Muzak, which <laughs> you know is the elevator music, which <laughs> means that your single is is uh, considered very commercial sounding. And yeah. they sort they sort of got in there in the arena, and they sort of promoted it. They didn't promote it as much as. A major label would, but they got it out there and it did very well. And uh, they didn't release a follow-up single like you're supposed to do. You're supposed to release like three or four adult contemporary singles in a row, and then maybe the fourth one will take off. And you've got to put hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars into it. And they just can't make that kind of commitment uh, at this time. But if they had done that, who knows? And yeah, sure, I'd I'd love that. I would. I would be with it because it's music that I love and it's not a compromise for me artistically. So uh, I'm ready for that whenever it happens. And uh, I'm also thrilled with what is happening. Yeah. It's your songwriting. When, when did you really feel you, you began to develop a confidence in yourself as a songwriter? I think it's the same type of story that I have about my, my, uh, the rest of my career, which is that the day I gave up trying was the day it started working. <laughs> The, the day that I decided, well, what the heck, I won't worry about all this format and all these record company people are pressing on me and all these people are saying you've got to do it this way and you've got to follow this formula. And I just said, I'm just going to tell a story. I'm just going to tell this story, this very personal story. And, you know, nobody will really like it, but it's the story that I want to tell. <clears throat> that right away became a gold record in, in uh, Holland and Belgium and and became this definitely one of the most requested songs that I sing in the United States, although it wasn't released as a single here. If it had been, I really suspect it would have had the same kind of success. And uh, that really taught me a heavy lesson, which is just write the song because you want to write it. Tell a story because you want to tell it. Don't try to craft this, um, you know, this is sort of carefully put together, well-schemed out thing. That just doesn't work for me. It might be that it works just fine for somebody else, but it just it's not what it's not what makes me feel really good, so I, I don't really think that's where I'm ever gonna go. Now you mentioned earlier you've been teaching music and um and teaching guitar. I believe you're gonna be working at a, a guitar camp, surely. Yes. Yes, that should be fun. Um your McCalkinen has started some sort of a fantastic guitar camp. I really don't know enough about it yet, it's brand new. Uh, his wife Vanessa is really a, a, a really energetic, really really super smart woman, and you know I think it's uh, I don't know really who came up with the idea, but uh, she's definitely making it all roll. And I'll be down there in April. I think there are three days in a row with with the classes all day long and so on. And so that'll that'll be uh, certainly hard work, but but very rewarding. Do you think in some way by teaching guitar it will also help you uh, in some way keep your own skills sharp and, and maybe pick up some yes. new, new tricks yourself? Oh, yeah. I think that, that every time I have to focus on the guitar, uh, such as this Guitar Summit tour that I just did, I don't know if you read about that, um, that really is good for me because, as I said, I, I don't know whether I'm just lazy as... Uh, lazy as ever or that I really do work so hard when I'm on the road that, that I don't want to look at my instrument and that that's legitimate. I really don't know. I think it's a little bit of both. But whenever I do something like teach or whenever I do something like go out on a guitar summit tour that, that uh, there have now been two guitar summit tours that I've been part of and they're all about guitar and they're four different guitar players. And you go on every night and you really just play your instrument when you think about when I think about my instrument, it definitely makes me push push myself a little more and pay more attention to the playing and not just use it as a backup to the singing. So that's always good for me. These guitar summer tours, is that going to be an, uh, an ongoing thing? <clears throat> I really don't know. I know that this is Guitar Tour Summit 3, and the Guitar Tour Summit 3 had two tours. 
the, in other words, the same people that were part of the third Guitar Summit Tour went on two tours together, with the exception that our dear friend Michael Hedges was part of the first tour, and then he died in a car accident, and tragically, and so uh, he was replaced by Stanley Jordan on the second Guitar Summit Tour 3, and he was also magnificent. He really was. So we just got back from that about a week ago, and guitar is definitely in my head. And today I'm going into the studio to continue work on a new album, so luckily I'll be playing quite a bit and won't be getting out of practice in the immediate. Just looking at your tour schedule, you, you do keep very busy uh, live work with live work. Um, what would be the extent of, of uh, an average year for you, tour-wise? Well, it used to be really, really extensive, and I've cut back very, very intensely, purposely. Uh, it, it was too much for a while. There was one point when I think that, that uh, I toured 230 days out of the year, and that was with very short breaks between, mostly very long tours. Uh, and, and home for a week and then out again and then home for a week and a half and then out for two months and it was like that all the time and it was like that for some years and I finally felt that, that I was getting making myself um, get run down and I became you know really aware that if I didn't take time off I was going to drive myself uh, you know really down really low and so I took about an eight month period with no work at all and then I felt a bit refreshed, and then I made sure, and now I make sure that I really take much less work. I turned down a lot of work. I turned down a lot of work. I try to play really good venues. You know, I have an image to uphold, and I, that's important after a while. You, you get to a certain place, and you feel like you want to maintain your your integrity, really. And so I, uh, one of the ways that we do that is... is is to um, make sure that I'm much more well rested and that I go out on uh, sort of listening rooms and stuff, concert halls and listening rooms. And, um, you know, at some point I stopped playing while people were serving dinner, that sort of thing. And there's nothing wrong with it necessarily. It's a good way to get established. But after a while I realized that I didn't want to play to, to uh, you know, loud, noisy audiences and that I was really all about playing to people who would come to, to listen. And, and I'm very uh, lucky that, that I'm able to do that. And my audiences are absolutely marvelous, marvelous people. They have really restored my faith. They really have. So it'd be fair to say that it, it's a quality of work you're probably looking for more now than, than a quantity. Absolutely. And uh, I, I don't mean, I'm not trying to sort of toot my horn and say, you know, isn't it wonderful and everything like that. But I do feel very grateful and very lucky that what I love to do has turned out to be something that can uh, sustain me. And that, that really, I think about it a lot. You know, I think about this is wonderful. Take a walk down the road and I think this is, this is really, I didn't think this would ever happen. I never thought I'd make any living at this at all. And so I have so much to be happy about and grateful for, and that's definitely one of them. There's something else I believe you've, you've dabbled in a bit is, is children's songs. Yes, that's tell, true. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, let's see. I guess because of my own children, you know, raising children, I've I've always been tuned into children and storytelling and, and acting silly with kids and having fun and so on. And my parents sang to me, and my dad used to make up stories, and, and I was always... Uh, surrounded with children's music and so on so it just made sense i began doing the same sort of thing with my own kids and then eventually somebody brought me into a project that had other people singing children's songs and that kind of started it out and uh, i mean all my life i've actually illustrated little books and written little stories nothing that i published or anything but just for the kids and so on and i've always been that's always been a very strong part of me you find uh, writing Songs for children more difficult than, than writing your own material? No, because it, it is my own material if I'm writing it, but uh, no, I don't think so. I almost think it's easier because it's very free. Yeah. And very, it's, un, it's untroubled, you know, it's just light and, and happy and fun. And they're no more, no more near as a difficult audience either. <laughs> This is true. No, 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 that isn't true, though. That's very interesting that you said that because, you know, kids can be very difficult to please. They can be very difficult to please. So 
they, they can they de- they definitely don't automatically accept you if you walk into a room of kids and you sit down and start plinking away on your guitar they're not necessarily going to think you're very good at all <laughs> so, you know, yeah. it depends on what they're interested in they're much more likely to say i don't like you <laughs> you know kids are yeah now you mentioned your new album, which you're working on at the moment. It, it, I think I read somewhere that was going to be primarily an acoustic project. Is that still the case? That's interesting that you read that, because I'm not sure yet. Uh, I think it is probably, but, but I'm I'm uh, hovering in different uh, possibilities, and I'm not sure yet. It, there are some other directions, and, uh, you know, the, chance, the chances, I would say the chances are great that uh, everything I've done thus far has been acoustic. Uh, so, and I'm rather liking that direction now. So it's, it's very possible that it will maintain a very acoustic and and certainly, you know, 99% blues type of uh, format. But there are some older tracks that I had recorded and not finished, and I I have them. They're ma- they're master tapes basically, and I have them on tape, and they just need a vocal here or some you know additional part there, and. Uh, some of those may end up on the album as well, so could go any old way. Do you uh, enjoy the studio environment, or is it something that I want to get over with as quickly as possible? No, I've always really loved recording. I, I almost loved recording more than anything else for years, and I think it had something to do with the fact that I was a very shy performer initially. I, I've changed quite a bit. I really uh, am very comfortable on stage now, but there were years and years where... Being on stage was very, very difficult for me, and I loved the studio because it was kind of like being in a womb, and you could just give birth in this very private way, and and, and you could be very passionate without anybody witnessing it, and then all of a sudden this album was born. And I really loved that more than anything else for a long, long time. Now I think my focus has actually switched, and I love live shows most of all. I love the studio too, but but I've made so many albums that uh, I have to discipline myself now more than I used to. Uh, now I have to make sure that I that I choose material well, that that I light a little, you know, sort of fire under myself and say, come on now, get down to work. You know, I, I have to push myself a little more. It used to be that the thrill of recording was so tremendous that, that I just went into the studio in this euphoric way. Now I have to rev myself up a little bit and... Whereas the live shows are always passionate, they're always. That's really where where my musical energy is is now. I think just because the audiences are so tremendous. I, I mentioned that earlier that they give me so much energy that that every single night is a is an incredible adventure for me. And and I I think that's where all my energy is now. Although I love the studio too. I I will never not love recording. I I've always loved it, and I still do. Do you tackle a recording project uh, differently now to, say, you know, 15, 20 years ago? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear one of the, the beep covered up what you said. Sure. Do, do you tackle a recording project any different now to, to 20 years or so ago? Do you approach it any differently? Yeah. Yes, I think so, but I'm not, I'm not really sure that I'm objective enough to say how, except to just repeat that, that I have to make myself um, focus a little harder. I've recorded... In terms of blues, I've recorded all the songs, with the exception of one or two, that I consider to be the all-time most fabulous classic blues songs that I loved. And so now there's a little more work involved. Now I have to go back and listen to old CDs and, and, and really listen again, like I listened when I was uh, first hearing music, blues music, and say, well, which ones of these are really inspiring and which ones really uh, are crying out to be recorded? And uh, I didn't have to ask those questions at first because I knew already Mississippi blues, canned heat, uh, walk-in blues, it, it, big road blues. I knew that there were like 10 or 12 core songs that I had to record because I, um, they, were, they were like the basis for all my knowledge of blues. Now I have to go a little further. So I have to push myself a little, but when I do, I can start getting very excited. In fact... Just when you called, I was, uh, and I have to get off soon because I, we're just about to, I'm uh, printing up words and, you know, I'm getting into the energy of being in the studio, preparing myself. Most of what I do in the studio, however, is very spontaneous, and I, I find that planning as much as I want to, it always changes. Um, so for me, recording is always like a birth, like I said earlier, and it's always an unknown. 
If you uh, had to classify yourself as either one or the other first, would it be guitarist or, or songwriter? Uh, well, there's a third part there. There's guitarist, songwriter, and singer. Of and course, all of them, yes. all of them vie for position. <laughs> and I don't know. I think that it, it changes depending on where I am and what I'm doing. The Guitar Summit Tour, I was a guitar player. Uh, you know, there are times when my entire focus is on my singing. There are other times when I'm, say, sing, when I'm singing a song that I wrote and the people in the audience have requested it and I know that it's hitting home that I'm really a songwriter. So I think it, 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 it moves, the focus moves between those three elements depending on where I am and what I'm doing. Depends on the moment. Okay. All right, Rory, look, I won't hold you up any longer. I know you've got a busy day ahead of you in the studio. I want to thank you for your time this morning. Oh, uh, it was a pleasure. Especially at such an early hour there for you. And uh, thank you for many years of musical enjoyment and hopefully we'll, we'll get to see you down in Australia. Not oh, to distant listen, future. If I wasn't, if I wasn't so afraid of flying, if I didn't try to avoid <laughs> flying at all costs, and that—that's why I'm not down there as much as I should be—is really because as much as I have to fly when I go to Europe, when I did come down to Australia once in the past, it was such a long flight that I was just so terrified. I was—I was basically crying when I got off the airplane, really? and I—I uh, I, I kept thinking I'll never get on another airplane again in my life. I hope that that at one point in the near future we become like Star Trek and we can beam in because I'll. <laughs> I'd love to come down there. I really, uh, I wish I, I wish I could, and I wish I wasn't such a terrible, terrible uh, scaredy cat. My husband's saying something in the background. He's teasing me horribly. <laughs> what? <laughs> but anyway, I, I'm, I have a, a reputation as hating to fly, but I do it anyway. I pride myself in knowing that I do get on airplanes on well, a very regular basis. If you do work up the nerve to, to come on down here, you can be sure we'll be here waiting for you. Well, that is so nice, and I really, really appreciate your time as well. Okay, thanks a lot, Rory. All the best with the, with the remainder of the recording there, and we look forward to the finished product. Thank you. Okay, take care. You too. Bye-bye.